Hello. Can anyone around here speak basketball? It's the Confederacy of Dunks Basketball Podcast. Kyle Lowry. Forever. Welcome to the Confederacy of Dunks Basketball Podcast. I am your host with a new intro, Freddie Rivas, oh. and who, sir, are you? The producer, Matt Duncan, and uh, yes, that is uh, definitely what the slogan of this franchise should be, now that we can't say back-to-back anymore. Yeah, right? it felt right. I thought about it for a while. Yeah. Um, it was almost Kawhi lost. But then I'm like, <laughs> I can't ride with that forever. That's not right. <laughs> um, and as you'll see, I get called out a little bit later in the pod for being a bit skip Bayless. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> I, got, I got some petty today and that's okay. A little, little Tom Petty. Um, yeah. Matt, uh, you know, we, we, we got a lot of uh, cool stuff people need to know. Um, why, don't, why don't you just give them a throw a fastball? Uh, give, give them the gist. Well, you know, we are now on the Sonar Network, which you can go to the, the sonarnetwork.com and listen yep. to us there. And then you can go to dunkspodcast.com and you can see all our links or listen there as well uh, for Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all the good stuff. And uh, all, you know, we got a nice slick link list of uh, pod catchers. You know, we're on Super most of them. Slick. It's real slick. And we're also on YouTube if you want to watch this episode, you know, it's starting to pick up a little bit. Uh, we, you know, we're getting a lot closer to being able to, to buy a house with our uh, YouTube bucks. Yeah, so, we're handsome, so there's that. <laughs> so if you want to listen and watch there, you can, or you can just keep listening on your subscribe podcatcher as well. Check out our Patreon. You can support us there. And, you know, maybe winter's coming as well. Game of Thrones, no longer on the air, but our toques are on the air. So you're going to want to <laughs> contact us. And they're us. not itchy, right? They're Did not itchy. That? These are non-itch toques, okay? First th- first of their kind, if you ask me. Oh, my God. Only of their kind. Yeah. First like non-wool a, toque. <laughs> it's like a Eurovision song that's just so original. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, yeah, um, check it out. Yeah. Check it out, support, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and before we jump into the pod, I just wanted to share uh, a pretty positive and cool, enduring story uh, in light of the, um, you know, Black Lives Matter movement uh, and, um, you know, the defund the police movement as well. Uh, and I think we can throw in um, reform the prison system uh, to this story as well. But uh, former WNBA player, I'm not sure if she will return to the WNBA, um, Rookie of the Year and uh, 2014 MVP, Maya Moore. Um, you know, she left the Minnesota Lynx to help uh, free the, uh, um, the J- sorry, his name is Jonathan Irons, who was wrongfully uh, imprisoned. And she fought and fought. And this wasn't attached to any major movement. She, you know, did this with like, she was informed of it and and fought for this. And uh, yeah, they actually appeared on TV today to announce they have gotten married. So wow. he's out of prison. Um, they're in love and uh, married. And I don't know, it's just a pretty cool story. It's a reason to fight. It's a reason to support people who are fighting, um, you know, for racial equality and for uh, black equality. And uh, yeah, I thought it would be a pretty good, pretty good news piece to start the pot off with. Yeah. Very positive. Wow. Uh, yeah. Of course. You know, um, it's just amazing to see the different ways these players are finding ways to, to make an impact. You know? Totally. And you know, the WNBA like stays undefeated as far as just oh, yeah. doing so much and leading the way, uh, you know, socially in every capacity. Yeah, get yourself but, um, a WNBA league pass and get watching. Do it. Uh, I got it. Super cheap, um, and it's really fun, and it's just awesome. Yeah. Uh, but Matt, uh, we got a we got a we got an incredible pod. Um, before we, you know what, before we just before we launch in, yeah. Uh, 
you know, Kawhi lost, we lost. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling as a, as a, as a Raptor fan, as a champion Raptor fan? Are you feeling all right? Yeah. You know, the first thing that I thought of when we lost was uh, it's been a really emotional 27 months for yes. the, for the team, you know, going from being swept from by LeBron to Casey winning coach of the year, getting fired, losing to Mark, you know, like it just, we haven't really, it's been emotional this whole time. And it, yes. you know, it really hasn't ended until now where finally like this haze is kind of starting to go away and we're able to see things and kind of look to the next step now. But yeah, it's just been, it's been a hell of a ride. And, you know, I just, when I gotta tell you, uh, when Casey got fired and it was all like, well, you know, if you go back to our old episodes, it's like, well, I guess we're testing out Nick Nurse. He should be good. And it's just been, I could have never predicted, predicted what have happened, you know, with us winning a championship and everything. It's been phenomenal. And we just need to, you know, stick with our players, stick with our team and remember that this is a game and these are human beings. And, you know, there's no reason to get ugly and nasty just based on a game. Love it. Well said guys, this is Matt is like 27 months. That's such a good encapsulation of what we've been through. It's, I feel like you're, you're like a, you know, a Kiwi or an Aussie (laughs) travel the whole world on your, on your gap year. And you learn so much. It does feel like that. (laughs) Um, but, But you know what, Matt, if you feel like we're ready to go, please just give me those sweet words. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we are here um, on the COD uh, podcast, and we're we're gonna get rolling uh, on our very first guest. Uh, he's done the pod, I don't know, a bunch of times. He's amazing. He's a hardcore Raptors fan. Uh, I think probably you know as hardcore as it gets. Uh, you probably know him from the Blind Spot and a bunch of other things. He's amazing. Get as loud as you can at home, even if you're by yourself, for Ennis Asner. Sorry, I was, just predict- I was just predicting. Jake Gyllenhaal. Sorry. Yeah, I was just uh, foreseeing the 2022 NBA Finals. The, Ooh, I like the that. The Thunder against the Raptors. You came in like hard announcer there. That was good. I mean, that that music was really begging for it. Really, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Honor. Uh, yeah. Herbie. Um, I don't know what to say. Ennis He's out. is. He's out. Ennis is a rising star, and sometimes you, you just can't handle the shine. You should um, hear my uh, uh, accurately, uh, dialectically accurate pronunciations of names. It'll blow your, blow your oh, hair Oh, yeah. I don't know. Though. Her, Herbie can rock that. Um, yeah. That's his, uh, it's his big thing. We all know the, uh, the enunciation on Andrea Bargnani. Yeah. Um, but we can forget about that because we got big things to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's bring on guest number two. Uh, he's hilarious. I mean, also pretty damn hardcore as far as Raptors fans go. Uh, you know, he was uh, one of the people who actually waited by the stage uh, in the parade. I think it was quite the ordeal, but he made it out there uh, alive. Um, we wow. watched game, game six together. It was amazing. We watched game seven together. Did this six, game six and game seven. It was also amazing. It was harder. But um, yeah, with no further ado, hilarious stand up comedian. He's amazing. Give it up for Alex Wood. <clears throat> This one's much lower energy. Hey guys, how are you? Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Um, uh, no problem. Yeah, sorry. Is this? I just want to make sure that's hitting. Oh. So this is one from opening night, isn't that like? I didn't that's even a, have to buy it. That's a pretty yeah. shiny ring. Is that a replica championship ring? That's you're legit. Wearing, sir? Why? Yes, it is from the Toronto Raptors 2019 NBA championship run. That's right. We did just win a championship last year. That was nice. Uh-huh. I, I keep mine upstairs. I keep mine upstairs. It's in a humidor. 
I can't wow. take it out. <laughs> it's, like an R, it's like an RSP. I can't take it out until the next time the Raptors get to the finals or else they tax me for it. I have a picture with me and my oldest brother, Francisco, with the Larry O'Brien trophy. Oh, yeah. No one can take that away from me. Pry that picture from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Do you have a hard copy of it or just? I don't. I don't. And I hope I don't die either. Um, Okay, cool. Let's uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, Maddie, I know you. I hope you you don't die also. Can we get that out of the way? Yeah, thank you. Let's let's all live forever, guys. Let let me just do a quick check before we jump into Raptors. Yeah. Alex, Matt, do you you hope I don't die as well? Yeah, no, definitely not. I hope you don't die soon. Cheers. Matt, Matt. Yeah. Like high hopes that you don't die. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. Um, okay, let's uh, let's jump into uh, some Raptors talk. Maddie, I know you got some kind of Raptors sting. Whatever you got, would you give it to me? Hashtag RTZ. The hard hashtag RTZ. New. <laughs> <laughs> um, this you know is that's the uh, same music they use for. Uh, uh, on location, on uh, on camera, uh, on cinema at the cinema with Tim Heidecker and Rick oh, Turkington. That's funny. You're the well. We've also been told it's used on Conan. Oh, hilarious! Which it's this just is... it's just like a, a, a an Apple loop you can get on Garage Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a popular uh-huh. track for folks who are feeling silly. Is yeah, what I'm determined. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's an homage. They definitely probably Tim Heidecker probably listens to the show. As oh, absolutely. Kind of yep. They're probably huge of- Raptor fans. And they just, <laughs> just in case you wanted to contact them for some publishing rights. I, uh, I missed the opportunity to say absolutely. He listened. Yeah, to that. there it is. Um, so sorry. That feels like a smarmy wienery joke. But uh, <laughs> still hope uh, you don't die. Still hope you don't die. Yeah, right. I don't deserve it. Um, Ennis, <laughs> let's let's jump right in. Uh, okay. This, uh, I'm still in I'm still in proud of this team mode. I'm still in Kyle Forever mode. Uh our future is bright. Uh we'll get to the Celtic series in just a sec. Um, but this year was absolutely in, insane. Um and Ennis, I'm gonna go to you first. I don't even I don't even want to list off the moments, but I mean just a couple. We got we got we had a ring ceremony. Um, we had a 15 game win streak. We had like a once in a once in a basically several decade comeback. Uh, we had the emergence of stars, uh, coach of the year. Um, yeah, there's so much more still. Uh, Ennis, what's your favorite, not necessarily moment of this season, but like thing, like what, what are you feeling that's positive? Well, gentlemen, you caught me at a particularly uh, petty moment because uh, nothing else to me right now is going to top the fact that the Los Angeles Clippers yeah. <laughs> did not get any further in the playoffs than the Toronto Raptors. As far as I'm concerned, we just re- uh, repeated as champions. That's what I'm <laughs> like I, was, I, I stayed up all night. I actually was invested in the game because, you know, Friday was kind of dark. We lost that tough, tough game yep. and the Clippers go up 3-1 and everyone starts talking about LA versus LA and all mm-hmm. the preseason hype looks like it's going to come to come to pass. And then look what happens on the weekend. 19-point lead, 16-point lead, uh, Denver comes back. And suddenly I realize that if the entire American media landscape is wrong, if all the expectations and hype and Patrick Beverly, you know, don't talk to us videos are wrong, that's pretty much like he should have stayed here. It's now empirically obvious that he should have stayed here. And I think that's really – it's the best consolation prize I can think of. So I'm kind of just floating on that, that we – had a better regular season record than the Raptor, uh, the Clippers, and they got no further than us, and quite frankly, got destroyed in their Game 7. So while I have no personal animus towards Kawhi, I'm just happy it worked out that way. Yeah, I mean, it's valid. hell. It's valid. That's my, no, right? Yeah, and it just goes, I mean, what would we have done with him? You know, it just now it's like they didn't get any further than us, so all this talk that he had the X factor and we were losing more than just his scoring and, uh, and uh, you know, you need you need that kind of uh, alpha at the end of games didn't help them. Didn't um, help them. Sorry, Ennis. Uh, so it's I'm gonna, clear to me that Kawhi carried us. We were a bunch of waste men, and Pat Bev and Lou Williams are much better than Fred and Kyle. I think that's what people have learned after this, this playoff run, don't you think? At selfie videos, I think they might be, but I don't know about it actually playing. Um, so Alex, that's it. That, yeah. 
pretty, I, I, pretty I, I'm, place. I'm jumping to you. Is this like the, are you feeling this overall? Hey, Raptors pettiness is a super important integral Raptors feeling. And it's, you know what? I don't even want to put pettiness on Ennis because it's an overall feeling of success. I think that, you know, this, this like a Kawhi and the Clippers losing and us, you know, losing in the last couple seconds, like that team gave up. Some of their guys asked to be off the quarter in the fourth. That's not how we roll. We don't go down like that. So like, I definitely think there is, it's pride too, but, but Alex, I don't want to put, put words in your mouth. Uh, how you feel? <laughs> uh, I, I didn't think I would be as happy as I was to be honest with you. Fuck I was it. conflicted going into the game seven. Uh, I mean, there's no denying. I, I didn't like, I didn't even think there was an overall, to be honest with you, narrative that I saw predominantly permeating across like all intelligent sports talk that Kwai carried us all the time. I see mostly balanced takes. I think like Raptors fans get too mad about like 14 year olds on Twitter in America. Sometimes to be honest with you, it's my only criticism of the Raptors fan base. I'm like, start looking at what like important sports talks heads are saying he d- and he did carry us in the Philly series. No doubt. Right. Mm-hmm. So totally. I feel like he never gets like neither sides. Right. Like I, I don't like when I've heard people say we could have won last year without him. And I'm like, well, that, I'm not going to pretend that because I've heard a couple people say that, that that's a obviously not lunacy that it's most a people don't subscribe to. Yeah. But wait, wait, Ka- Ka- Kawhi aside, what's your favorite part of the season? Opening night. It's, I know it's on the nose, but I went and to actually like see the banner going up in the place that you had seen, like, like, I, I mean, what was it? Like the banners going up and, like 15 months ago, I was yelling about Jakob Pertl, like so excited, like Jakob Pertl's going to be the guy to, to get us back to the conference finals. He's going to be enough off the bench. He's going to be our sixth. I love Jakob. I still do. He's like, great. He's gonna, yeah. He's going to grow. He's going to be like a fucking double walking, double, double and shit. And uh, nothing against him, but to think like that was the, <laughs> Last thing that like pumped me, I was tripping out, you know, just seeing the banner grow up is amazing. They give you the ring, which is incredible. And I went with my friend Adrian and we had gone to game seven against Philly together, a bunch of the playoff games together, uh, obviously games for like years and years. And uh, it was just what a payoff. And together our record at Raptors games cumulatively, like it's actually very special. It is before uh, a bad run this year. It's like 23 and four. It's nuts. Whoa. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty deadly, like fan those, combo. Those are Nick nurse uh, playoff record numbers. And remember, this is like a dating back too. This is not like a, uh, like I moved here in 2013. I started going to games the next year. So this is, this, they weren't like always rolling here. Oh God. No. Um, all right, you know, we got it, we got to do it. And I think for people who listen to this podcast a lot, it might be nice to hear me say, you know, as someone who's ragged on Brad Stevens and the Celtics for Uh-oh. all these years, <laughs> I do think there's a certain amount of credit where it's due. I thought he coached a wonderful series. Um, and uh, the Raptors lost in seven, so. You know, I still hate him <laughs> and Celtics fans and, and Celtics, but they did beat us. So cheers to them. Um, do you I hate still him hate- specifically, or do you just like think the hype is un- unwarranted? Uh, that I, I hate, I hate the hype because right. I really do think he's probably an extremely nice person. Yeah. Um, but uh, just the overall hype, which to me w- peaked at, would you rather have Brad Stevens or Giannis Antetokounmpo in your franchise? <laughs> which is three years ago. That was peak. Wow. Peak Brad Stevens is better than any player in the wow. NBA. That was like when it was like Boston, like just when he came out of, uh, I think it was Butler. It was the peak of like a coach knows best garbage, which I really hate. And um, yeah, anyways, but you know, he did, he did, um, he did beat us. Uh, Ennis, I'm going to go back to you for this one first. Um yeah. Uh, do you know, do you think there's anything we could have done? I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I do think there are some things we could have done differently. I know it's conjecture. We lost. Uh, that's kind of why I'm giving the, the credit where it's due. But yeah, you know, h- how does this play out in a way that Toronto wins in your mind? Well, it's interesting because 
looking at the empirical evidence, which I am uh, wants to do at all times because usually mm-hmm. it points in the Raptors' favor, um, up to and including Game One, uh, I was deeply worried about our chances against Boston because they had killed us all season. And it was those kinds of games where you go, well, the, the Raptors are never going to shoot that well, or that was one game, or, or sorry, the Raptors are never going to shoot that poorly again, yeah. and uh, and or the Celtics are never going to hit every shot. And that yeah. seemed to be coming out of every game. Like the Christmas game was like that. The game in the bubble was like that. There was an earlier game where it was just we couldn't hit anything. So at certain points, you know, that, that's a, that's the thing that comes out of most uh, wrap ups of games that were uh, closer than they had any business being or a shocking upset. It's always like, well, they're never going to hit all those shots all the time. But yeah, good point. That's certain, always a sign of danger when someone's like, yeah. oh, we just missed shots. It's like, yeah, it's the process to get those shots, baby. But I mean, you know, uh, could we have done different? Th- I mean, I think it's all it's just we've missed a ton of shots and it's hard to looking at Boston's defense. And still trying to get a, 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 an understanding for um, like what I'm seeing and what it's the product of and not just being linear with my complaints like, oh, we're not hitting shots. Like right. you need to pay attention to who's covering on switches and how the defense goes into the paint. And then it stops your drive, which stops your kick out. And that means you don't do certain things before that. So I think yeah. Boston had really, I think, maybe the best defense we played against all season outside of Miami, who maybe just doesn't have the the, the – I don't know, the key guys, like the, the three-headed monster of like the Marcus Smart and all these threes. Not that they don't have shooters, but mm-hmm. uh, we had a tough time against Boston, and I think uh, that all just came to bear. I, if What we could have done differently, and this is not to knock on anybody, it did seem like Gasol was too slow to handle the series and a step more hesitant on offense than he usually is because he usually yep. pump fakes a three and passes in the first couple of minutes any game anyway. But he was doing – he just seemed way more hesitant. He wasn't taking shots. And I, call me crazy, I, Matt Thomas looked great at any time he was on the floor. And in that last game, he was keeping up on defense. And he's way faster than I thought he was because all you see is shots of him shooting. But he finds his spots. His pull-up jump, like, two is also great. And I kind of just I, – I thought he deserved another five to eight minutes. Like, if he just hits, you know, two, three threes, like, it's a different ball game. And it seemed like we could use that spark. So – that's not a point to the whole series because there's a lot of things that could have gone differently. And, and, uh, but I think that that's one thing that tangibly in game seven, I felt like, hold on a second. We could, we, we have something they haven't seen yet. Throw it at them. And you know, they went with their guys. They went with their expensive all-stars that got us to a chip last year. And I don't begrudge it. Um, I think I, I'm just going to pass it off to Alex because I feel like I, and it's kind of like you, you hit on exactly Basically, where, where where I'm at is that you know I really feel like Nurse threw the 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 book at them in terms of zones and different coverages, but he didn't throw the book at them in terms of players. And I feel like we got, we exited the bubble having more like uh, whatever the expression is, more like you know shells or you know more more bullets still that we hadn't fired, whether that's Boucher or, you know, yanking Gasol and being like, okay, no one plays as good of zone defense as Gasol, but we have to figure out another way to generate offense. We need a crashing Boucher or, or we need uh, you know, a wild Rondé or whatever. Like, I don't think we threw the book at them. And I think we went with our expensive all-stars. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, you gotta, I think, Siakam at some point there was a hope that he was going to like so many of those layups were almost in like he seemed uh, snake bitten on top of everything else yeah. you know there were so many like yes he would he was like he was like Jonas in terms of it, it reminded me of like he took just a second longer to do the thing it was like whiplash like he was lagging and rushing the movie whiplash not like the actual condition of whiplash but you know what I mean where he was just constantly like hesitating but then dry, but then deciding to do something but then sticking to it and not really not keeping his, his uh, you know, it's like mellow when the ball goes to him and it disappears, that kind of rep. Like, he just yeah. had it and was like, I have to score now, and then couldn't kick out. But at the same time, it's game seven. The offense wasn't moving without the ball, so what else is he going to do? You know? Totally, and, you, you know, like about Siakam, you could see where he was free on defense because that's just hustle, IQ, he, you know, that's in his body, like his muscle memory. And he's just like, I can defend anyone at any position. I'm the fastest person on the court. I can make a crazy impact on defense, but on offense, you know, you didn't see that. Like uh, uh, Miguel said on the, on the last podcast that Tatum's superpower is his patience. And I think, you know, with, with Pascal, you're like, you see that it's like, it's their direct opposite actually. Um, and I think a part of that was the types of looks he gets and the 
overall flow of the offense. But, but before we get too far down this road, Alex, um, how do you think we beat the Celtics? I think the defense played like overall pretty well. And I think Nick was good there. The one adjustment that I, I saw them make it about halfway through the series. And I, I wanted it like early. Like I thought they were killing us game one with this is like, and I was surprised it took this long. I thought this was coming all year that the were like, okay, the Raptors, everybody knows we give up the most threes in the league and we get, and they don't, and they shoot the worst percentage against us. Like, so clearly don't take the first look when they're closing at you like a fucking maniac. Like when Pascal or whoever it is, is charging at the three that's wide open, just stay calm, pump, let him go by, take a sidestep. They did that with almost every single three in game one. Yeah, they used our aggression against us for sure. Yes. And I just thought like, I'm surprised it didn't come in that game. And it certainly didn't even come in game two, which was upsetting. I was like, well, come on now. You, how do they not get it? Where it was all of those looks. And then I started to see them almost like close, like slow down on the close down or give it that second, you know, that backhand contest too. If you did overrun it and they pumped you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's gotta be hard playing defense that way. Right. Like I think people probably don't appreciate how exhausting it is to play defense the way the Toronto Raptors play defense. That That's a fantastic point. I, I mean, I think you saw that too with... You see that on the other end. And then and everyone even wants, just the IQ too. It's like, yeah. you have these five or six guys running like, you know, two or three, you know, zones like every three or four plays. And it's like, they're done. And you have to mm-hmm. trust other people to facilitate your defense or or live with the results of extremely... Tired offense. Hey, can well, I ask a question to add to this? Oh, sorry. Sure. Go ahead. I'm just on the other end, too. I thought like the Celtics were giving us the paint and we weren't taking it. Uh, and that was really frustrating, too, because then in the later spots of game six and game seven, we were giving them the paint and they were taking it. And that's real. I mean, how many Tice got so many easy buckets, even in game six? down the stretch and in game seven, just easy buckets because he was they were We were giving it to them and they took it and we weren't taking the paint when they'd give it to us. We stubbornly kept sticking to threes, which I know is our whole offense is predicated off that, but like, well, you can't be, you can't get that. Like, I mean, switch it up. That's the adjustment. And I think Nick will catch up on that end. I, I oh, think yeah. this series really crystallized for me. And I know it's how obvious it is, but it's like, especially this series, I was like, Right. This is like a defensive genius who like knows how everything at an opposing offense. And then he's pretty much just good with this, like laissez faire freewheeling. <laughs> like we play like a version of like new street ball on offense. You know what I mean? Which is, it's, not- it's so strange though. He was opposite in Houston. He's like the offensive guru. That's I like, know. That's you know, he was, our, he was our offensive guy behind, uh, under I know. Sorry. And that's what's like tripping me out is like this, just watching this series, I was like, we're, this is not, the defense was not problem all series long, except game one, really. Uh, and even then we got through the first quarter. Great. It was that second quarter. They blew it open. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I mean, there was still a lot of that Dwayne Casey, like triple horn handoff two smalls offense, which I think is, is really good and still not enough teams use it. But my whole fear with the Celtics series is like, dude, what are you going to do with the Brown Tatum size advantage? Because Fred and Kyle are six foot and all the smarts and speed and shooting in the world cannot overcome that. Like, well, don't, too. don't forget Clay Thompson, six, seven. Right. So like a lot of these small ball teams, they still have big guys mm-hmm. like, you know, I know Dallas won with like Berea and kid, but it's like, that was that it hasn't happened again. Sorry. You're talking about the, the triple handoff. Sorry. Just really quick. Their defense can switch everything. So what are you going to do? You're like, well, not if we do it three times. Like, exactly. No, stop it. <laughs> and then you just waste 10 seconds. Yeah. But sorry, Ennis, I feel like you had a question. Yeah. On the defensive end, in that in that sense, just looking at how shallow the rotations are, and to be honest, like how much they were working on defense, leading to, if I may, uh, postulate 
uh, a lot of the turnovers in game seven where, you know, Serge does that thing where he like kind of passes but doesn't really check and then turns it over on a pass to Fred. Fred leaps in the air and then gets rid of it. Uh, another hand, another like small little thing that Fred would never usually do, losing the ball. Like you take two of those back and we win that series. You know what I mean? So that's how oh, close we were. I know. Or, you know, the box out on Grant Williams. Oh, when Grant Williams was shooting those free throws, I was like, oh, we got this. This is good. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get this rebound. Watch this. And it happened, and then we couldn't even get the ball. Like, and then to have Kyle foul out on that, like on 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 uh, another rebound, like so when Kyle fouled this. out, me and Alex knew. Was oh, we looked I mean, at each other like, yeah. Cool. Sorry, it was almost like we, we were we were beating back an air of in- inevitability. I think because it was the first time since Casey was the coach that I sensed. A, a, a kind of stagnation on offense that they weren't able to yes. see their way out of. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm not, again, it's not against, Kay, nothing against Casey, nothing against Nurse. I think they just got thrown so many different waves of things, plus the short rotation making us tired. Mm-hmm. So dare I suggest, not just Matt Thomas, but wouldn't somebody who's like a defense, like wouldn't Rondé have, have maybe warranted a few minutes? Like he's great on the boards. He could have helped Terrence us on the offensive Davis? We were, But I mean, even like, I'm talking about size-wise, like to match yeah. up with like a Tatum or a Brown. He had length. He's, he's, you know, he's a little sloppy on the offensive end, right? But he's he could have helped. And I, well, I just wonder if you give him uh, eight minutes a game, ten minutes a game, so that he's spelling Siakam, spelling OG. Like, OG took three shots in game seven, which I don't understand how he only gets three shots, which tells me the offense isn't clicking. So they're not, you know what I mean? They're not yeah. moving around as much because that's crazy that he only took three shots. Duke can hit, you know, he's scoring 20 points a game when he wanted to. So... I, I wonder if someone, if like, because Ron, Ron is sitting right out. He was, he was a small ball center. You know what I mean? He played center for Brooklyn. Like, it seemed like one of those no. things where I, I wonder, I, I'm asking the group, like, do you think, is he so, uh, such a uh, minus on offense that, like, what do you think? Why do you think Nurse didn't play Ron Day at all? Alex, you want to go first? Yeah, I think it's that he's such a, but that's the thing is they were giving us the paint. I mean, Ron Day wouldn't have been a crazy group. He was finishing strong all year at the fucking yes. rim. I didn't mind Rondé. Uh, yes. Give it a look. Uh, uh, and especially when we were getting blown out in game one, I'm like, why aren't, why aren't other people out right now? Why mm-hmm. aren't like for so many fucking reasons, you know? And um, also um, like, anyways, I, I agree uh, with your OG thing too. And one of those shots was an offensive rebound. I, if, if I, yeah, if you know yeah. I mean. attempt to put back, right. Yeah. And he missed them both. And fucking, uh, sorry. Just like, I forgot about that rebound. So I, my head's really, as oh, soon as you sorry, said it, sorry, I, I'm sorry. I, went, I was like, Oh my <laughs> God, that's right. I know. It's like opposite of Kawhi getting a rebound in the Philly <laughs> series late or in the, in yeah. the Bucks series late. Yeah. Um, okay. You know what though? Um, oh, I'm sorry, Alex. No, I it's okay. See, I, I can't unsee it now. Guys, most, uh, most listeners can't see this, but Alex is really crestfallen. His he's body hurt language a bit. Is, His body language has changed a lot. But I, okay, I'm going to cheer you the hell up, Alex, because um, I think we all still love Nurse and we're really happy he signed long term. Absolutely. We, weird transition, yeah. but he is a sick coach. And, you know, I think we understand continuity is really important for the Raptors. So, I want you, um, yeah, because so, you're in just a bad meditative place. Let's go to a good meditative place now. And just, you know, you don't have to, you know, dot every I and cross every T and tell me what, what, we're, what you know, Boucher is going to get on the open market. But g- give me an idea of, of the Raptors team you want for next year. And just to kind of set the listeners up um, and set you up, um, before anything happens, um, our roster is Kyle Lowry, Norm Powell, Patrick McCaw, likely Stanley Johnson, Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, Terrence Davis, Matt Thomas, uh, Duan Hernandez. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the squad. Uh, and that's like 86 million right there. So that's roster. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Well, I will say, based on recent events, my theory that under all circumstances, no matter what, even if there's the emergency break the glass situation, you don't fucking move Pat McCaw. Clearly, that man is in tune with the basketball universe in ways we don't understand. And that's wow. just not, a, that's objectively just not true anymore. So we could lose, if it comes down to it and Pat has to leave, that's fine. Boy, Pat didn't play. 
Yeah, he was hurt and we didn't win. So No, I know, but <laughs> I mean you gotta still think if he's on the roster, that magic should be there. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So your your main thing this offseason, you focus on Pat McCaw. Yeah. Well, I, I mean now it's I, I he's not he's he's no longer safe. He's to me, I cared more about keeping Pat McCaw than Kwai. I was like, as long as Pat's here, look at it. His track record is proven. Hey. It doesn't matter. Just have him in the building. Something's <laughs> happening here. This can't be an accident. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, and I thought that was funny. Uh, my vision of them next year is uh, is definitely the same team or thereabouts. I would love if Mark realized his limitations from that series. Like, bro, you had more time than you've ever had off. You're only going to get older. Take an at a league minimum take like the smallest you can and, and never start a game for us ever again. Hopefully I, I, I think he's got like, like eight minutes a game still in him, especially on the defensive end. I am not going to say that I, I watched a great YouTube breakdown of him. Sh- he shut Tatum down in game three. Totally. He we don't win that. game three without him. And I'd love if he takes the league minimum because he, you know, he could get more than that somewhere else. But I'm thinking that he loves it enough that he would want to stay here. And I think if he wants to, anything even significant, we don't give it to him. So I want him to be gone. I don't think Serge Ibaka is done being a good basketball player. And I think we should fucking pay him. I don't – I, and it sends the message out there to, to other UFAs. If you do well by us, we do right by you. I want to see him make good bank on a very, very short deal. Um, and I want us to uh, somehow do that while keeping Fred and enough money to go after splashy free agents. And that means Fred is probably going to, that's just not possible. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible for us to pay Fred, pay surge and lure a free agent. I mean, we just know we don't have the money for that. And I think everyone's trying to say, sign Fred. And and then the, and then the free agent and I think that's wanting too much and I think we'll you know I hate this term but zig while everyone else zags and we'll be a big team if we land let's say a Giannis to pair with a Pascal and a Surge it's like that's a gigantic fucking team in this league but all of those guys can kind of at least kind of stretch the floor Giannis not really but you know what I'm saying I think yeah. that's the move is to Fred's gone and I hate it I don't want it but he's gone. Like it's gonna happen. We all know what team's gonna do it, and they're gonna say do it. it. Say it. Yeah. Say it. The Knicks are gonna fucking. The Knicks will pay him forty ah! million a year. The Knicks Ugh. will pay him like whatever he fucking has. And who wouldn't want to like bet on yourself, swagger? You know what? Kevin Durant didn't want to go rescue the Knicks. Guess who does? Fred fucking Van Vliet. And they're gonna pay him. They're gonna pay him twenty five a year. And. uh if you if you're one to think of, about exponential growth and his youth and everything else, maybe he's not done yet. His defense will never age poorly, it seems. And uh, I don't know. I don't think we're keeping him. And I I just I don't think it's the end of us necessarily. I I wouldn't. I don't think that's a sky is falling. I think it's more heartbreaking than we thought it would be. And it's it's. I I don't like picturing it right now. I'll say that, but he's gone. We know it. Um, well, I, I definitely disagree. Can I yeah, jump Ennis, right in here? Ennis, just, uh, just jump right in with your full off. Just not all about Fred, but give me your yeah. whole picture. Like, just like Alex did. I want to hear I mean, the respectfully. Story. I love the breakdown of it. It makes sense. There's passion in there. There's logic in there and there's honesty in there. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I got that in, in bunches, but in different, in different places. First of all, uh, the main question I actually need an answer to, and I don't know if you guys know it, because I read Blake Murphy's uh, phenomenal Blake Murphy's um, athletic uh, postseason cap hole breakdown of what our salaries look like. I read it twice, and I still I think I forgot English after that and math. I don't, I don't understand it. Huh. Uh, the main question I want answered is how like how much can we sign Fred for and still have room for a big free agent? Now, I'm not talking Giannis because if we're being Giannis, um, I just I just coined that. <laughs> That's really nice. That's nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's That's be really let's, nice. Like, let's be Giannis here. Um, there are a ton of like the, the free agent class in 2021 is like it's the first two rounds of a fantasy draft. Like it's crazy mm-hmm. in terms of how, how many players are available. So um, the question is, how much can we sign for and still have money freed up to uh, be a player in that market? 
So now to that end, I'm going to go the other way and go, I don't think uh, Bobby Webster and Masai let assets go for nothing. And given that we cannot, just like two, three years ago when we allegedly overpaid Serge Ibaka, it doesn't look like that now, but uh, because we couldn't replace him with anybody else, there was nobody else that could fill that spot because of the way the cap works. We can only overspend on our own guys. And quite frankly, I think Fred's going to get asked for what? Uh, they're, they're saying the Malcolm Brogdon deal, which was four years, 85 million. I think we would be fools not to pay that. And that way we at least have the value of whatever Fred Van Vliet is to us in the future going forward. Like the players like that, we don't, we can't just let them go for nothing. And I do feel like the bet on yourself thing has to do with more with him. There's a betting on loyalty thing that I feel like is not, you know what I mean? They're not done here in a way, like, cause he's got enough things to feel his personal slights, like too small for the Boston series. Uh, is, can he be, is he, can he take that next step? Uh, would he, t- like, he feels like the kind of guy who would take less money than the Knicks would offer because money is not as important. You know what I mean? Like I, in a way, uh, yes, I think the Knicks are going to throw in like, a, a, and, and you know, the Detroit and Atlanta, the other teams that have money and need a point guard. I don't see why he would leave a situation when there's this much potential right here, you know? And I, I don't think we can pay, hopefully the, the thing is I hope we can pay him, Mark, like not that much less than what those teams can offer him. If someone offers him 30 a year, you know, Godspeed, do, do your thing. But like, if it's a few million dollars a, a season, that's the difference. The other thing is decreased cap post COVID, all this stuff. I, I also feel like maybe they could sell him on taking a one year and allowing them to be freer in the, in the off season. I mean, you might argue that they didn't do that with Siakam and why would Fred take a one year deal? But that's a bet on yourself too. Maybe he's done betting on himself. Maybe he's like, but nobody wants to play for the Knicks. That's the thing. He'd just be taking money to do what? To finish ninth? Like, what are the Knicks? What are the Knicks going to do next year? He's the only free agent. They're not going to get Anthony Davis. Like, if they get well, him, they're going to sign buddy, Christian Wood. But when you have go to the, the finals. But when you no, have I mean, the ring already, when you have the ring already, and you have two kids, and they're as much as he does bet on himself, believe in himself, he yeah. still knows the way this thing works, and it's like I can, I can max out my life right now right now i just think we could offer i think we could still pay him like four years 80 mil and make yeah yeah i i 20 is my exact number for him 20 is my exact number for him i would i would go to 25 total but uh 85 total but uh now to that i'd say ibaka um is in the same category you pay him because worst case we're in a situation where maybe there's a sign and trade that happens in 2021 where a guy and you know i would love Serge to retire as a rapper raptor maybe i don't know if he raps um uh, i would love fred to be here for five more years and get paid what he deserves at the same time uh i don't know how much those gif commercials pay i'm sure it's a lot oh uh, yeah million yeah, dollars to take i think i just got a residual check for four dollars so i mean we all know canadian show business really pays a lot um, oh, for sure in the long term but I, I just don't see Bobby and Masai and the Raptors front office letting go of guys when they don't have uh, uh, really viable replacement options, and when those when they can turn that into future value down the line. I just think there's there's so much at stake that having a guy make twenty three million a year or whatever Serge is going to get or Fred's going to get is valuable when you're trying to uh, add an all star superstar in the free agency year from now. Yeah, um, guys, uh, I mean, I was going to do a little bit of a, my own dance here, but I feel like, do it. well, I don't know. I feel like you both have it covered. So the only thing I'm going to say um, is that, yeah, I don't know what my exact number for Fred is, but I lean more on the side of there isn't a Fred replacement in the market. Um, every team has a point guard they're grooming. Kyle is on going to be on his, his, his next year's 30 million Kyle the in 20, like 21, 22, that's when the decision and, and OG, whether we extend him this year, I think you kind of push it. I, I think you push the hard decision basically down the line and particularly with Giannis, unless he demands a trade this season, the Giannis talk is a year premature. Yeah. So really as far as like having space for him, I don't know what that number is, but I know that Pascal is on a, um, you know, he's on a, like not, not a, he's not on like a super max. He's on uh, like a rookie, a a rookie extension max. So I'm pretty sure you can have like Fred on a lower, if he's lower than a max and Pascal lower than a max and bring Giannis in if he wants to. And if you need to, 
the only thing I'm going to say, I feel like you guys totally have it covered. It's kind of a mostly bring it back scenario. I feel like if there's extra money to go around and we miss out, I wouldn't mind a Joe Harris. Uh, I wouldn't mind a Montrezl Harrell, but I care way more about Bobby Webster and Masai. So I think that to me is kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and you know we're 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 gonna draft a player too, uh, Terrence Davis. Uh, you know how how good is he gonna be next year? So I, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of factors here, but um, I also want to talk some NBA stuff. So we got we, we got to keep this train rolling. Is that okay with you guys? And by the way, I'm gonna read this and we'll talk about it later. But uh, okay, um, there is Blake Murphy put out an article four hours ago in the Athletic. I don't know if you have a subscription to that. I guess I'm buzz marketing it. How much can the Raptors pay Fed Van Vliet and sell at max money in 2021? Is the name of the article. So. Uh, we probably we'll should have read that. We, well, it just came out. I didn't know. Uh, the uh, other thing I'll say about Fred is that maybe we can convince him to take the one year because of the dip in the uh, whatever max salaries are going right. to be because of the cat. So if he, if it's a one more year bet on yourself, that is the tough decision, though. I'll tell you, what do we pay Kyle? I mean, if he keeps That's doing right. this, keep pay, you know, he, he had arguably his best season as a Raptor this year. You know what I mean? The, the last That's thing. That's the lunacy of it. The last thing I'm going to say about Fred before we kind of jump to the rest of the NBA is I think when people think about how good he is or what he can be of be, be like as a part of our team, they need to really look at the games he played without Kyle Lowry, which is roughly basically 18 points and 10 assists. So you have to like looking forward at Fred. He's not going to be Kyle's 35 or 34. So he's got a couple more years with Kyle tops then he's a point guard playing with much bigger guys for the rest of his Mm -hmm. career theoretically um okay let's let's go let's go to the nba because there's still a bunch there um maddie uh i hope you're doing good if anyone's watching he's rocking his downtown magneto on shirt so (laughs) i know he's ready for this sting maddie if you got an nba sting would you give it to me I gave that Bobby Webster shout out for you. You know what? I really appreciate that, that uh, you're including Bobby and Masai together as one big super team. They, well, I mean, it's that, looking perception, like that. that perception needs to be more widely realized. <laughs> I think uh, Masai is so deified, uh, rightly so, but Bobby Webster really doesn't get the ink. And, you know, I read an article about how he basically engineered the Spurs deal from his contacts when he used to work there to get Kawhi. So, he is the GM besides the president, right? So yeah. people say GM, they still think Masai because he's got this great persona, but put some respect on Bobby. And, and I know you've been, well you've been at the front of that. You've been at <laughs> yeah. the front of that train since it left the station, Matt. I know that about you. <laughs> what Ennis just said is basically like he, he gave Matt a MDMA pill. <laughs> like that's how good you just made Matt feel. Okay, for old for old time's sake, guys. When I say Bobby, you say Webster, Bobby. Webster. Bobby. Webster. Webster. <laughs> cool. We're cool. We're cool. Uh, okay. How many, of those, how many of those do you have, Matt? Be honest. How no many versions? <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, I have a digital closet full of uh, pro yeah. Bobby Webster stings. <laughs> and when you're trying to sound as creepy as possible, <laughs> All the time. That's the yeah. deal. <laughs> okay, Alex, we, we already talked about Kawhi uh, a little bit, but I, I want to, you know, I'm going to frame this question as like, first of all, shout out to Murray and Jokic and the Nuggets. Uh, I think they deserve some love here. But, um, you know, we were talking a lot about the Raptors legacy uh, in terms of like, you know, Kawhi carrying us and all that sort of thing. And I, I feel like there's been a lot of, I mean, the NBA is full of recency bias. Uh, anyone who listens to this podcast knows I've been saying Giannis is the best player in the world. Even when we beat him last year, Kawhi was not better. He was not better in the regular season. He still is not better, in my opinion. However, I think a lot of people were like, no, Kawhi is the definitive best player in the world. He cannot make a mistake. He didn't score in the fourth quarter, um, lost in the second round. That's very, very bad. I I don't think LeBron's ever done anything like that. Um, I still love Kawhi. He worked his ass off. He got a title for us. He's an incredible player. What do you think this does to his like kind of Mr. Perfect legacy, Alex? Um, okay. 
I'm just going to acknowledge the obvious bias that like between you and I, I think I have warmer feelings towards the man in general than you do. Uh, okay. I there was, like I there was I a little him. bit of Fox news undercutting <laughs> on your, uh, on your, on your assessment of his. So I'll, okay. Okay. <laughs> I missed that music cue, but it sounded like wrestling music. I like it. Uh, yeah, I will say, that I think what it does to his legacy is it fucking humanizes him for everybody that says he's a cyborg, because this is what I think happened. Probably if for sure during that game, I saw for the first time, like, Oh, emotions are affecting this guy's play before I could see like anger driving his play. Like, a like that's okay. Right. I mean, we all know it. He's just not demonstrative. But last night was the first time I was like, you don't want to win for these guys. You don't want to break your back for them. You resent the fuck out of their bullshit that they've done this year. And I didn't really wow. think, I don't, I really think that, I, I mean, I might be bringing too much into it. I think he was sitting there like thinking like, yeah, maybe he was thinking like I had a group of fucking professionals last year. They lived and breathed this shit. And, and I think Pat, Bevin, he had no Kyle Lowry, like, Pat no, Bevin, nothing PG, like him. Yeah. And Pat Bevin PG clowning, other guys when they haven't done anything it's like who the fuck do you think you are that speaks to how they're gonna play and you can't see paul george hitting the side of the backboard and not feel like a little i don't care who you are and be like oh i'm excited that this is the guy i've tied my wagon to but as far as it affects his legacy i think this is what it affects his legacy on basketball court is the same way people going too much on pascal right now it's the exact same thing if you're going too much on Kawhi. If you're going too much on Kawhi right now, what you're basically saying is you're he's not Jordan, and we're and we're mad about yeah. it. He's not Jordan. He's not. And guess what? The guy is in the same breath as him now. He's not Jordan. He's not LeBron. You know what I mean? And guess what? Michael Jordan's a human too, who lost seven times in the playoffs. Precisely. So, so it's like you know, you're, you're, that's what anyone who's like Kawhi. I'm reading some awful tapes, even by smart people. Like I don't want to say them in case they fucking. Lewenberg or whoever the fuck, like I'm seeing smart people being like, Oh, he shouldn't have won the MVP for the Spurs series, which is like, no, yes, he should have. Did anyone watch that? Or the infamous like LeBron uh, GIF of Kawhi oh, yeah. back in when he's at the free throw line and he sees it and then goes like, come on, man. Like the guy is still proven himself over the last five years, even with the downtime to be a top 50 basketball player of all time. Let's not fucking pretend this guy is somebody different now because of like, well, really bad showing. Like, I'm not saying he didn't, he should have done something, but I think he was broken by the bullshit of his team. And so let me say, honestly, I need, I need a bit of a, I need a bit of a slap every once in a while. And it was getting a bit, you know, skip Bayless there. Uh, Kawhi is a legend. Um, and I love him forever. Uh, I have a picture of him in my room. Um, but Ennis, uh, yeah. did, did Alex, I think Alex kind of nailed it with the, with yeah. the, just humanized him. Cause like, it's almost like the myth of a player can, can outgrow their actual abilities. And I think <laughs> Kawhi was kind of on that end. Um, and maybe now people are like, Oh, wait a second. He's amazing. But everyone has, you know, moments where they're where they where they can't just overpower right them. where they have an off game well i'm gonna say i'm gonna i'm gonna take down 24 hour sports media uh fan hype and uh and, and team expectations all in one fell swoop this none of this game is on Kawhi. the man averaged 30 points and 10 rebounds uh, for sure uh, in the playoffs he had two games under 20 points two games where he had like you could call them poor shooting games he did every he shot 50 percent 86 from free free throw uh, 33 from from three, which is a little two two point three steals a game, and that's just that's just uh, statistically what I'm looking at here. Uh, I don't think anything that happened in this series can be attributed to him, and I don't think it, I don't think it affects his legacy at all. I think that the rush to anoint a best player, mm -hmm. and then as a result of that, there must be something wrong with players two to nine or two to fifteen on that list is so misguided it's turning things into a debate that don't even have to be a debate i watched yeah. it and i mean listen i love uh stephen a smith for the uh deliberate human cartoon character he tries to be now mm -hmm. but there was a, an, epi an episode of uh, the jump where it was him and kendrick perkins debating um the celtics lost game six to the raptors and it was like do you blame the celtics or do you uh credit the raptors and each of them had to take a side and then they were arguing it 
when that does not need to be framed as a debate. Yeah, it's and both. all these things, I think all of this gets caught up in it. Like, you know, I, I've had really I mean, smart pa- people Pascal say Pascal Tatum, right? Well, That's exactly. I mean, series. first of all, and, that, and we have an answer there, by the way. Tatum, I didn't realize Tatum was 22. I thought he was the same age as Pascal. Tatum, Tatum is a, a problem. He's terrifying. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even this whole thing of like, well, he can't be the number one on the championship team. There's like two of those. You know what I mean? And I've had smarter people than me put this out there. How many people are uh, a number one on a championship team? There's one a year. You know what I mean? And and if you look at the last 10 years, it's been LeBron or the Warriors. So it's not like there's been a ton of parody and it's been like a different guy emerging every year with the outliers of like the Mavs winning and uh, you go back as far as the Pistons winning, who didn't really have an alpha, unless you want to talk about Chauncey Billups. But all that rush to, to anoint prematurely the best at something then makes it like it's all set up for disappointment. The Philadelphia 76ers, they should be like, they're on a path, man. Ben Simmons is in what his third year. They're still figuring out blow how to it play up. together. Yeah. Every year it's blow it up. Like the never wait. Are, yeah. McCullough, never, Lillard, blow it up. Right. You got to put the, and like the second they traded for uh, George and uh, sign Kawhi was the Clippers are going to win it all. It's L.A. versus L.A. I mean, it showed you a week ago. We were all like 3-1 Clippers. That's It's L.A. versus L.A. And look what happened. So anything it, – it's what's great is that we're looking at – like nobody had the Nuggets making the Final Four. I don't know who had the Heat making the Final Four, but the Bucks are out. The Sixers are out. The Clippers are out. The Rockets didn't make it out of the first, the second Raptors. round. You know what I mean? Like Raptors too. I mean, we, Raptors were getting a lot of Final Four predictions. But mm-hmm. I think that's the problem. And, I mean, if you're Kawhi, quite frankly, I think it's like, all right, I get to see my kids now. I'll see you next season. But yep. – there are, I think there are, I, 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 if anything, it points to like how good a team Toronto and a culture Toronto had last year. And that maybe adding like Kawhi was an upgrade over DeRozan, right? We already had an A or a 1A, 1B, whatever. Uh, and and with the emergence of Siakam, it was kind of an embarrassment of riches, if you ask me. But on a team that where suddenly everybody had to go down in a pecking order with two guys who not only have to learn to play with each other, but also in a new system, in a new city with all this pressure where – Say, Paul George can say whatever he wants. Everyone was calling it predicting a championship before they touched the court. So I think that I think it's not. A, I think his legacy is is fine because he's not LeBron and he's not Michael Jordan and he doesn't have to be. And it was it was people's fault for calling him the greatest of all time before he did this anyway. And it's one bad game. He deserves a bad game. You know what 100%. I mean? He's probably out of oil or or uh, lug nuts or whatever he consumes on the on the sidelines. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's all part of the, the rings or bust kind of toxic conversation in basketball. Yeah. Um, let's just do a, a quick last question before we do, um, uh, before we hit up some quickish questions. Uh, give me like a version of a yes or no. And, and, and maybe this is a narrative that I'm searching for that is not quite there. Uh, Anna, so stick with you. Right. If it's like the Lakers and or the Nuggets versus the Rock uh, versus uh, the Heat uh, yeah. and or the Celtics, are we having like, is that a big ball, small ball finals? Oh. Or am I, you know, thinking about it too much as like the Warriors small ball took over the league and this is like the the kind of like the big ball answer back? Well, to be honest. Or is it just kind of for two Frankenstein teams? Well, three of the four final four have uh, dominant centers in different ways, right? I mean, AD, Jokic, and uh, Adebayo. And Boston's kind of the only, I mean, they played Tyson enough. I know he's not, he's undersized for the rest of it, but he can clearly hang in games with players that are bigger than him. Uh, so I don't know that the small ball thing as it, as it existed is, has taken up, like is, I don't know who goes small. I don't know if you can go small. You're taking away too big, too big an option. Like Adebayo is going to be charged with shutting down the biggest guy on, or the biggest most athletic guy on, uh, I guess it's Tatum on the Celtics, right? But it's going to be him versus Davis, Davis versus Jokic. Yeah. I don't know. I think, uh, they're still tall, by the way. There is no small ball. I know. It's, know? it's, it's, it's more like skill ball. Uh, uh, okay, let, let me... Again, even, that, even this notion, like, it's a way to play. But I think, ultimately, if the Houston Rockets had had, like, a white side or a canter as a just-in-case, that series might have gone longer, you know, against the Lakers. They had zero options for Anthony Davis. That's like, kind that's of nuts where... nuts to me. It's not fair to P.J. Tucker. It's not fair to Robert Covington. That's where I'm going, though. Is this... Um, like a referendum? Yeah. Is it a bit of a referendum on like, you know, the Rockets, the Rockets were like, guess what? We don't have a big guy. And the yeah. Lakers were like, guess what? We beat you in five. Yeah. So it's a little uh, bit of like, is that, is that a real thing or? 
I think it's clear that a big dominant force underneath that can also do things that are expected. I mean, Jokic is one of the best passers and point guards in the league. All these guys can hit threes, you know, like uh, Embiid as well is in that conversation. There's uh, Towns and all these all these big men that are excellent that are doing more than what was expected of a big man in like the '90s or the aughts. But no, I, I yeah, I think maybe. If you're looking at the Rockets as an example, it feels like if they at least had a guy, even if they had Cantor, just to put his arms up, you know what I mean? Something like, as a guy get, named Dennis. Get some O-Reebs and then like rub his shoulder, like out. Yeah, right. Yeah, his, um, his, his shoulder is still not okay. <laughs> Alex? Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah where, where, where are you at? Uh, you know, is this like a actual conversation or am I just making up a question? <laughs> I think... You're right, but it's just in response to something that wasn't an actual conversation, and it was an aber an aberration because it's the Golden State Warriors won't be repeated because they were a magical unison of the two best shooters of all time. You know, every team doesn't have that, so everyone trying to play like that, and then D'Antoni, I mean, he's going to go bring that shit somewhere else now, so there'll be another team doing it, right? Like he's leaving. Um, I think. To answer your question, the league is probably just remembered and hopefully everyone will remember like, oh, right, an inside-outside game is actually how, what, 90% of the titles have been won since 1980, like at least. Uh, And I think Jokic and Murray are reminding people of that. And then LeBron's Mm. a freak who plays everywhere, but him and AD as well. And then Miami's just a really balanced team with uh, guys of all different kinds of like, basketball makeup and guys that can fucking, I mean, and, and then I think the Celtics are the ones still probably maybe right now proving like, no, no, the nerds are right. Play like nerds. But, but I think there's <laughs> my, the best time for basketball and not just because I was like, you know, my kid, I was a kid watching this shit is the nineties still because there was talent all over the league and people play different styles. That's what was cool. It was like, oh, are we going to have like a run and gun tonight? Are we going to have the Knicks that are just going to like gussy this shit up in the paint and like the Rockets doing that too? Like people play remember, different remember the styles. Cavs? The Cavs used to just be the team that you'd be like, they're just going to bore the hell out of you and play slow, methodically. Like the scores would be so low when you played them, but that was their thing was to yeah. slow shit up. Where like uh, I think you can you see a return that? to that now where yeah. instead, of this, instead of the whole league always trying to copy one format, you know, we could have the league being like, everyone's trying to just do play their own style now again. There's, yeah. some, you know what? There, yeah, there's some of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think I've, I'm feeling good. We, we got a bunch of quickish questions. So I, I want to hit this up. Are, are you guys ready to answer some questions as fast as you can? Oh, wait, NS, we'll I feel like. Can I say one thing up. about D'Antoni? Mm-hmm. Isn't it fucked that he's gone now? Like, what does that team look like? What, what do they do? Like, do, is it, do they regret all of it? Do, do they try to get. Do you immediately try to trade Covington? And also Tucker went to that team to play with Paul and did it for what, like a year? And then Paul went away. Like all these things happen with these big expectations of the win now. And then what, what are the, I don't understand. That team is not built for anybody to coach except for Danton. Well, and, and, and the pro, like, I'll add to that too. The problem is um, they were messing with his assistant coaches almost as soon as he got there. They kept firing his def- his favorite defensive guy and then he kept convincing them to come back. Yeah. So I think sometimes... Uh, like franchises look like they spend a lot, but they, they save on like coaches and development and like really kind of where it matters. Yeah. And then you have, yeah. Like a, a guy like Dan Tony's like, I'm too old. Like I want to coach with my team, um, like with my team of coaches. And if you like, you know, I'm not, I'm not desperate enough that I'll just stay here forever with you guys continuing to mess with me. I also say one thing just about the bubble, uh, you know, all this analysis is fun and it's been great to be able to not think about serious things for a while, even though, you know, uh, try as we might, uh, reminders of these players, humanity gets, uh, you know, uh, thrown in our faces. Uh, Mm -hmm. More so now, I think there's a bravery to it to be this, like when George, when Paul George admitted he was depressed and anxious uh, about what's going on in the world and, uh, you know, the police brutality and the racism in America, the anti-black racism, uh, and just everything else and the fact that these guys are away from their families. Like I think about Siakam, I don't think I saw him smile on the court for the whole playoffs. And this guy is usually like just bouncing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think on one level, it's not a, that it, there should be an asterisk, but asterisk, it's a comic yeah. book, um, an asterisk, but uh, more than any season, I think the humanity of these players 
and what was expected of them, the burden placed on them, these, you know what I mean? Even the crazy choice to like, to, to try to boycott and strike. And I just think it's all swirling around there and we just would be remiss to not to remember that these are uh, people uh, sometimes being directly affected by uh, anti-black racism and just in general, the politics of trying to be the face of a progressive league and you know what I mean? But also still playing a game while also having financial responsibilities and also having fans chirping them on Twitter. You know what I mean? So it's just something about it's just an impressive league in general. And it's been fun to be able to just analyze it on sports alone. But this is why when people get nasty about Siakam and, you know, I, I laugh because Trey Burke hung 30 on the Clippers in the first round. And it was like he wasn't on a team two months ago. But huh. you're going to start attacking their, you know, their humanity. You've gone too far. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great point. And it's been like such a privilege, I think for hardcore fans to be able to see the league hit it on so many levels and, and, and the bravery that we've seen all over the place. And, you know, obviously the WNBA shout out, you know, it's just like also leading the way. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's been emotional and powerful and uh, incredible. And again, we're, we're so privileged to be kind of like analyzing the X's and O's um, mm-hmm. and appreciating like a deep playoff run within uh, within a year where there was a plague. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but you know what? I, th- I feel like we got some, some craziness left. So let's, let's hit yeah. up. Let's do some quickish questions. Uh, Maddie, I feel like you're ready. I don't know if you are, but you look ready. <laughs> oh, Give God. that quickish question sting. Quickish question. It's an ironically long sting. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> oh, there's oh, yeah. a lot of ironic parts about quickish questions. Um, <laughs> like the yeah, biggest really one, I can't, I can't yeah. read well. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's how it's going to go. I'm going to read the, uh, these questions as, as quickly and as clearly and as stutter free as possible. Um, Stretching. You're all going to answer. You, you know, you don't think aloud. You just fire away, you know, phoning a friend. Don't stall. Uh, you just got to come at me with an answer as quick as you can. Oh, dear. Uh, are you all ready? Yeah. Matt, yeah, Matt's yes, not ready. Yes, yes, Before yes. we start, I'm a staller. I want to say the last time I did quickish questions, I took a good three second pause before I answered, but then my answer went on to be, I think OG Ananobi can be our big shot three at the end of the game guy. So wow. okay. I'm going at my own pace for quickest questions. Fair enough, but that pace Honestly. per OG should be 0.5 seconds. <laughs> it should be half a second. Yeah, you don't need three seconds. You need 0.5. Um, Crazy. That's a good we need a buzzer. We need a buzzer for this category, by yeah. the way. Like, okay. Be able to buzz people up. Here we go. Let's do this. Let's let's go. Um, let's do a little uh, Matt Alex Ennis. Oh, me right, first. Ready. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Like you first because that's uh, okay. You know what? No, uh, I throw okay. We'll no, no, that. stick with it. No, no, it's okay. Stick with it. I was going by the Zoom. We yeah, yeah. Stick with it. Stick with it. Here we go. Okay. Matt. Yeah. Do you feel bad for Kawhi? No. Alex. Who goes to the finals and who will win it all? Lakers, Heat, Lakers. Ennis. <laughs> are we worried about Serge Ibaka, about Serge Ibaka's ties to Harden and Westbrook and that James said basically that the Rockets want him? Do we still have the best chance to resi- resign Serge even though Nick Nurse didn't play him in a crucial late game situations in game six and game seven? Ibaka looked like he really wanted to be out there. Uh, I'm worried now and I <laughs> hope so. Well, and this is worried now, folks. Um, okay, Matt. Uh, also, uh, it's the person's second question. Also, why if all season NBA teams tout depth in bench and such, but when the playoffs start, they go to short rotations of seven. Meanwhile, the depth is unused, and by the end of a uh, seven-game series, all the primary players are gassed. Why couldn't Nurse insert Rondé to check Tatum and Brown at times to give Pascal... Uh, a breather. Every time uh, FVV looked overwhelmed by the Boston uh, game, put TD in to match energy. Play Boucher against Robert Williams the third. Matt Thomas did not look like a liability in any way in his minutes played. 
I personally blame Coach Nurse, who I am glad we signed to a multi-extension for not utilizing the depth of his team. Comment? Uh, I just like to say... <laughs> if- this, this, this premise, this whole, this whole segment is... You, I just ended it there. It needs a, it need, you need a reboot of this, of this segment. <laughs> uh, Matt, do you have a comment? Well, that? I, I will say that if if uh, you're asking, uh, you know, based on a decision that Nickner should have made and didn't, I think that uh, it's been rumored that he has been uh, playing uh, at night way too many Chicago songs that are very long, and uh, he's not focusing enough on his playbook. And you know, uh, he's coming to the games a bit tired. No one really knows that. Great answer. Don't play Chicago the Musical on your guitar. <laughs> No, the band. Oh, Wait, look, I, assume, I, I assume you meant like twenty-five or six to four. <laughs> I, I, we all interpreted that a different way. That's good, Alex. Saturday um, in the park. If you're LBW, which I can't figure out who that is, how many years slash dollars do you offer Fred to stay? Serge, Mark, do you offer anything to Mark? Keeping in mind that salary cap will likely decrease. So LBW stands for Little Bobby Webster. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to say Fred. Yeah, I mean, I like right what uh, I had it right what Anna said. So I'm gonna. It sounds like a nice round number. It's four years eighty. For Surge, I mean, I know that this is like. I just think he loves the city. This is ambitious, but that's four at 10. I really would love if Woo. he takes it. Yeah, and that's a discount, obviously, but not even that much. And he, it's, I love him. Uh, Mark, like I said, I just, I can't because the free agency class is coming up. In a perfect world, we, if we, you know what I mean? We, but you can't, I don't offer him anything. Unless he says to me, I'm coming for the league minimum. Then I'm like, you have a role on this team at that. But if he even wants, Six a year. It's like, no, bro, sorry. Ennis. Yes. Further down the bench, Rondé, mm-hmm. Miller, and Boucher are free agents. What yep. would you do with them? Uh, resign Rondé, resign Boucher. See you later, Miller. Matt. Yes. What is the best sign and trade destination for Giannis at the end of the next uh, at the end of next season? If he doesn't sign a supermax and the Bucks uh, crash out of the playoffs again, it could be Raptors or non-Raptors. I think that the the right answer is the Toronto Raptors. I think that he would be a great fit here. And I do think that, you know, the Raptors should be what the Montreal Canadiens were to French players in like the 70s and 80s. We get all the, you know, the foreign players, all the top ones. So I want, I want Jokic. I want Giannis. I want Ben Simmons. <laughs> you know? I love it. Uh, Alex. Which team regrets trading all their picks more? The Clippers <laughs> or the Rockets? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I got to live with this <laughs> question for as long as I possibly can. That's good. Fuck. Um, it still has to be Houston because they are an absolute now, as uh, Ennis demonstrated earlier, What? who coaches that team? They're so screwed. And the Clippers will still be a title favorite next year. So, but for right now, it's Houston. Which and picks? What, what did they trade, by the way? Can I just have that? Res- what, how many picks did the Rockets give up in that deal? Oh, the Rockets and the Clippers have traded, like, over the years. I know the Clippers. I know, I know the all Clippers. All of their picks. Like, right, I, to get hard, in getting Harden and in getting... Uh, oh, yeah. And, and P.J. Paul. Tucker, like, everybody got, like, you, yeah. You have to go through, but I bet you the Rockets have, like, two or three second-round picks in, like, eight years. Wow. Um, Tucker was a free agent, wasn't he? He was. They saw. Uh, he signed with uh, Houston instead oh, of Toronto. Instead of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah whatever. Um, and but yeah, okay, a lot. Okay. What would happen to your wrist slash arm slash body if you tried to block a dunk like Bam did last night? Uh, I think it would rip off at the shoulder and go into <laughs> the net with the ball. That's perfect, um, yeah. Matt. Yeah. Who is the next player to get kicked out of the bubble for doing something dumb, and what will they be kicked out for? Um. Oh boy. Okay. I think it's gonna be someone on the Lakers. I'm feeling like it's gonna be like Rondo, and he's gonna break curfew to go like paddleboarding in some kind of like alligator pit. <laughs> ha, Ennis. Or I mean, sorry, Alex. <laughs> 
uh, I'm just so excited for the alligator pit. Um, <laughs> Alex, if we had done a true run it back with both Kawhi and Danny Green returning, how far would we have gotten into this year's playoffs? <sighs> Le- Lebronto narrative would have been rewritten. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, they would have won it. I think that's pretty obvious. I don't think that can be. I think I- everyone's saying that. That's every take I saw after last night. Like, yeah. Where they would have won. The Raptors would have won. Hundred percent. Ennis, why yeah. am I so mad about the Pascal bashing? Uh, and then uh, the writer says, relative to innumerable other dumb takes. Oh uh, well, because it's like a, it's so entitled and all getting super racist at a weird time. I think is what happens. Like we, he went from. Uh, backup bench mob three years ago to oh now he starts oh he can contribute oh most approved player next year oh he's in the most approved category again we don't have Kawhi look at this he's filling 23 points a game starts in the all-star game three years ago he had done nothing and nobody expected any of this and all of a sudden he has one run of bad shooting games which can be explained by very you know what I mean people get the yips people get in their heads he seemed it seems pretty clear like you know it's, he's not injured obviously he can play that defense and I think that uh, again it's, it's a problem with like something has to be wrong if they didn't win the guy's gonna learn from it he's gonna hit more shots he's gonna learn triple spin moves he's gonna be doing Lutzes and sow cows and we'll be back in the deep in the playoffs next year I was angry he started over Luis Scola and Jared Soldier <laughs> so enough said yeah I really was upset about that Get Chuck Hayes back here. Oh, yeah, Matt. I mean, you're Matt's loving you right now. Chuck Hayes, Bobby <laughs> Webster. What next? There you go, Spurs? Um, oh. Matt, oh, he gave you the hand. Uh, Matt, when will the Raptors next play a home game? Thinking about the Blue Jay border crossing slash 14 day quarantine situation. Oh, man. Um, that's a great question. I, I really don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. Do we know? Who knows? We don't know. I can't. Just, I don't. I can't. Hey, that's an acceptable answer. <laughs> yeah. Alex. <laughs> Jamal Murray is from Kitchener. Besides him and Blackberries. Yes, I know that's Waterloo. Shut up. Did anything <laughs> good come from that city? Uh, I'm pretty sure Kitchener Waterloo has a uh, city ban on plastic water bottles. Oh, Take that, Yao, who was on the pod last week. And um, Master T. Master, wait, Master P or Master T is from like VJ? Yeah. Master T is yeah, from Yeah, he Kitchener? grew up in Kitchener. Sick. Dennis, last question <laughs> of the pod. It's a hit factory out there. Yes. <laughs> if Nick Nurse had coached this Clippers team, would they have gone to the finals? <sighs> You're just suggesting something that would never ever have happened. I, I think the premise of the question I refuse to acknowledge because <laughs> okay. he would he would never leave the Raptors to the, go to the Clippers. Why would anyone do that? Correct. Correct. Thank you. Um, buddies, that's the pod. This was a really, really fun one. This is a really fun season. Uh, for anyone who's, uh, who's listened, thank you so much. It's, we're going to obviously keep going in the off season, but um, uh, Alex, I'll start with you. I know you're, you're doing shows, man. People can go watch you. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, safely. Um, uh, Alex, uh, what's what's going on? Like, th- this is going to come out uh, on the 17th. I do shows in my backyard. I have the Backyard Comedy Club. It's every Friday and Saturday, West End of Toronto, five minutes from Jane Station, where everything's outside. People wear masks when they're not seated. It's like a big hit in the neighborhood. Show's coming up. In the next little bit, include Nathan McIntosh from Conan O'Brien and Late Night with Jimmy Fallon and a bunch of other stuff. And, uh, and uh, all the best comics have done it. Juno nominees, come out, check it out. Mm-hmm. Look on Eventbrite. Huge, <laughs> huge. I like it. Ennis, um, what's up? Uh, you're you're in you're in Toronto. We we played tennis yeah. uh, two weeks ago. We did. We did <laughs> play tennis. That's about just, it. Just bragging. I played tennis. No worries. Yeah, um, yeah, that was good. It was good. Uh, I lost. Uh, you know what? I lost horribly, but I actually played well. I, I I didn't win one set. You know what? I'm Ennis. This is time for you to promote yourself. Not, Did you want to? Is there anything else you wanted to plug, Freddie? Nothing. <laughs> I'm bad at tennis. So sorry yeah. I brought it up. Um, uh, I don't. You know, no. Just uh, I've been fortunate enough to get a couple of little jobs. I'm not supposed to talk about yet. Uh, that I'm working a little bit, keeping distance. Please wash your hands. And also, uh, 
you know, there's a big debate about whether or not the, 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 the NBA would still have leverage to make change if they had actually walked on the season period and mm-hmm. not played in the playoffs. And I just, I guess as fans, I would challenge uh, us all to keep the same energy and keep following the initiatives of and the, the messages of the players and not detach from uh, the uh, racial unrest. I saw a great tweet that was like, uh, it, was, it was like white people love to refer to uh, what's happening now as everything that's going on, and it's not just white people. I do it too, right? Because you don't know what you're supposed to call it. You know what I mean? But or, uh, or yeah, the George Floyd situation as opposed yeah, to or the situ- Floyd yeah, murder. you know, call it, calling it racial unrest doesn't feel right. And uh, but I mean, I think in general, just keep paying attention to things that these players have been bringing to our attention. And you know, I know I've learned a ton in the last six months, and, yep, uh, me too. and I just I would say while a lot of it's distressing and painful and horrible every day. Um, think about the players and, uh, and support them. That's it. Just support them as people. Yeah. And you know, I'll yeah. just say, I'll, I'll just jump on that too. Like th- this is my own personal opinion, but I really feel like the more you engage your capacity for empathy does grow and build. Yeah. And if you're someone out there who's has nervous feelings about being an ally or you don't want to be wrong, just know that you will, and that's totally fine, and that's part of the process, and that's part of learning is being vulnerable. So, so put yourself yeah. out there, and um, yeah. Support. Oh, I guess I would also like like to plug uh, the Encampment Support Network, which is a grassroots organization in Toronto fighting for the rights of unhoused uh, um, residents of a lot of the encampments you're seeing, where there's tents all over the city. They're being taken out of their own, you know, the, whatever they're trying to forge ahead as homes. Um, by the city and the politics that are kind of marginalizing and forgetting about them uh, during COVID. And uh, if you follow, uh, look them up, the Encampment Sport Network on Instagram. They're constantly looking for volunteers and donations. And uh, again, just there's been no lack of ways to think about people who don't have it as good as you do. And I think that's a good thing for all of us. Hell yeah. Um, well, uh, and also, yeah. Alex, I'd love to come to your show. I didn't mean that. It's not a contest. No, 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 no. Also, check out Black Creek Farms in Toronto, man. They do like, uh, they grow their own vegetables and give them out to people that live in the Jane and Finch area that can't afford it. It's like, if you're like woke on climate change and the uh, everything that's going on, it's like uh, three birds with one stone if you want to volunteer or donate. It's Black Creek Farms. Awesome. And uh, we've uh, done a couple of the backyard shows that have been a uh, benefit for them. So, amazing. Hell yeah. Um, guys. Matt, what about you? Is Matt plugging anything? Matt, are you? Well, well, I don't know. Matt, what's up? When is your sting album of stings coming out? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't really have anything to plug. Uh, you know, I did uh, just buy a dartboard. So maybe I'll be starting a winter <laughs> league. Uh, if uh, you don't want to go to the bars, I'll try to find a way to socially distance it. And, yeah, he'll, uh, he'll bring the dartboard to you. Yeah, I do. I've made my own uh, backboard for it with some insulation foam, so we won't make any holes in your uh, wall or brick outside, and uh, we can wow. have a good time. Holy yeah, shit! Let man. me know. Let me know if you're for your comedy shows if you want to do a warm up. <laughs> no, Matt. Matt, you're not an asshole. Matt was ready and waiting to plug that dartboard. <laughs> Just check it out. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, that's why you got a two. It's a nice. Wait, I can't see it. I can't see it. Huge regulation. Oh yeah, no, it's. uh, Oh, there it is. I see it. You see it? Yeah. You've really protected that wall against strays. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a little bit. I don't have much experience, so you know, I got to uh, protect the wall. And uh, but yeah, it's all legit. I got the line over here, and uh, it's five foot eight to the uh, bullseye, ready to go. Are you uh, free at three three p.m. tomorrow? I'd love to get a game in. You know what? Take take the old goat train down to Newmarket, and uh, yeah, let's have a game of cricket. Hello. Can anyone around here speak basketball? There it is. It's the Confederacy of Dunks Basketball Podcast. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network. 